All right, ETM Hotep, welcome to our YouTube channel, the Seshu Mahdi Metal Nature YouTube channel. And today is Friday. And as usual, today is our Freestyle Friday. And um, our Freestyle Friday is something that we uh, picked up and started up again. Uh, I think this is our second one, or maybe even third one, since uh, our restart of it. And our Freestyle Friday is um, a day where we have fun, where we uh, take what we know from our memory and we make attempts to transliterate and translate uh, random inscriptions uh, that either requested from members of our Facebook group, uh, inbox to us, email to us, or some different inscriptions that we see on the internet and that we choose. Uh, but the whole idea is to take the inscription and to try to um, transliterate and translate without the aid of any sign list or dictionaries. So it's a um, exercise to, to really evaluate yourself and your own proficiency and competency in the language. And so uh, it allows you to know what you need to work on, uh, how far you've come you know, in your journey of learning and how far you need to go. All right, so we're all learning and this is not um, an exercise to uh, put anyone down or or anything of that nature it's actually uh, an upliftment uh, exercise and we're all in this together and we're learning so this is just for us to have fun uh, and it's the start of the weekend so we chose to do it on Fridays to kick the weekend off with a little bit of fun uh, we could be out uh, partying or whatnot but we chose or choose to um, you know do some brain exercises so with that said this is your brother Wujao um, and also on the panel, we have other members of the Seshu Maani Meadow Nature. So I will, um, you know, open the floor. Uh, everyone can introduce themselves and then we can just jump right in. Hotep, we're an E, Imikit, and uh, you know, welcome to Hi. ETM Hotep, welcome in peace, everybody. It's your brother, June. Uh, thanks for tuning in. It's Freestyle Friday. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the show and leave with satisfaction. Hotep. All right. And other members will join in um, as we get started. All right. So for now, we will kick things off. And, and um, what we've done in the past that was customary for uh, us to do was to recite the offering formula and so sometimes we didn't do it because sometimes the actual inscription that we go over on freestyle friday as well as our divine words wednesdays may involve the offering formula so uh there are times where we opt not to do it because it'll be done within the content of our um of our session our online session uh so I believe, I'm not sure if this is one of those instances, um, the picture that we are dealing with today, but um, let's just play it on the safe side this time and let's just recite the offering formula. And I'm gonna put it on the screen. See if we can get it up to the screen. All right, so this particular offering formula is is one that we suggest that people use to memorize and to understand the four major elements of all of the offering formulas. Now, each individual offering formula may be different depending on the recipient of the offering. So we have different items that are being offered and so on. Uh, but they all, all of the offering formulas will have at least four main elements to them. And if you understand the elements, then you could pretty much understand all of the offering formulas. So this is one that's very good. It's not too long. It's not too short. And it has a certain cadence and rhythm to it that allows you to memorize it a lot faster and be able to retain it. So I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, Sunet Emiket, who can um, break down this offering formula for us before we begin. All right. Um, do a so uh, what you have and what you're looking at in your screen is the offering formula. And um, once again, um, on the top part, 
there are three sections to it and the top part is the sesh medunacha um transcription and the, the middle part that would be the the transliteration and this written in diacritic and this is what i'll be reading and then the bottom part that would be, that is the translation and um in this instance um the the offering formula is um on behalf of the ancestors which will be the aku but uh, you can always insert the name of um, an ancestor that um, you'd like to include in the offering formula and you can also recite recite it with me uh, you know recite along while i do it so um, i'll just go ahead and and, and read it so um hotep tinesu wasser nepjedu nature ah nep apju tf peret keru tihen ket ka apet shes men ket Het nebet neferet wabet anhet neche im in kani imaku aku makiru. And what he says is, an offering the king gives Osiris, Lord of Jadu, great God, Lord of Abydos, so that he may give up all offerings in beer, bread, ox, fowl, alabaster, and linen, everything good and pure on which a god lives, for the car of the revered ones, the ancestors, justified. All right, Ikir, excellent. And so that is the offering formula that we open up our sessions with. And also, uh, along with remembering it, uh, just so you'll know the ele four major elements of the offering formula. Um, and just by the way, just to point out the four different elements, uh, the first element that's within all of the offering formulas is the opening statement, the opening phrase, where we have Hotep Dinasu. The first three words. And so that begins the offering formula. And it's referred to as a formula because it's very prolific in the literature of ancient Kemet. All right. You see it everywhere. Uh, and there's more formulas. Uh, we have the Jed Medu formula, which is like modern day quotation marks, uh, which Jed Medu, by the way, means uh, words spoken. And, in some t and it comes in two forms, Jed Medu itself and then Jed Medu in. Words spoken by, or they'll just say words spoken. Um, and then there's elements to that. But in this particular case with the offering form, we have uh, the first element is Hotep Dinasu, which is the opening phrase. And then the second element would be uh, the deities and the epithets of those deities. Or ma matter of fact, a deity or deities, plural. And then any epithets that accompany the deity or uh, if there's mo multiple deities, epithets for those deities as well. So in this case, the deity involved would be Wasir. And then, of course, you see the epithets of Wasir afterwards. So that would be set the second major element of the offering formulas. And then the third element is the invocation or the voice offering itself and all of the items or commodities that are, are in the offering. So you'll see steak, chicken, uh, beer, bread, um, and notice I said steak and chicken because that that would be the modern way that we would we would kind of identify these things. But it's actually fowl, which would be birds, uh, cattle or ox and things that would be beef or whatever the case is. If it's um, done with a cow or whatever the case is uh, and beef is steak. So modern, we would say chicken and steak and beer. So you have bread and beer. So today we would say bread. We would say, you know, uh, rolls. So chicken, steak, beer, rolls, uh, wine sometimes, uh, sometimes milk you'll see and, and whatnot. But anyway, the third element would be those items. All right. And then the fourth element, last one, it would be the recipient. Who, who is to receive these? So you'll see a person's name and then their epithets or titles, you know, their, their titles of their uh, jobs and things that they held uh, when they were living. Okay, so those are the four elements of that. And as Sonat Emiket said, in this particular offering, um, the person, the fourth element, if you're going to use this uh, today, then what you can do is you can replace the generic word. Uh, I can't turn my cursor on, but if you look in the fourth line, the last line, you'll see where it says in Kani Imaku Aku Makeru. 
Well, the second word, well, actually the third word from the right, the word Aku is a generic word that means ancestors. So if you're going to use this for yourself uh, today, uh, then you could replace that word Aku with a person's name that that may be a relative that have that have passed away or whatnot, family members and so on. And you, you can use more than one or just one person. So that's where you would replace. So you so we say Inkani, Maku, and then person one, and then Makiru. So keep that in mind. All right, so that should um, bring everyone up to speed on the offering formula. And we started that out because of uh, it's a routine of something that we picked up from uh, Dr. Riketi Amin. Uh, she usually starts off her undertakings with you know, beginning her undertakings with the offering formula, which kind of sets the tone and stage for for any discussions and things, uh, especially online, because in person, what people will do is a different ritual. They would they would pour libation. So if you notice that any, you know, events involving African centered uh, issues or uh, African cultural issues, libation is poured at some point in in the event. Uh, you know that you go to a, an, an attend and since we can't pour libations online we opt to do the offering formula okay so that's the rationale behind that all right so freestyle friday so today we're going to go into this particular picture now this picture was posted by brother christopher withers inside of our facebook group the seshu maadi metanature facebook group so if you are not a member of the facebook group uh, make sure you become a member and it's the same name as our um, our YouTube channel so you could type it in and you'll find us and uh, request to join and you know we'll make sure you get in if you're not already in and um, just be ready to learn you know everyone's learning everyone's sharing information in there uh, you know it's a very good environment to come in and um, and learn and share okay that's what, the things we emphasize all right so uh, the brother Christopher Withers uh, posted this particular picture. So we, you know, we're just going to use this for our freestyle uh, Friday. So if Christopher Withers is watching us now, then you know, uh, do I appreciate you posting it? We, you know, we just selected your picture. <laughs> All right. So um, now, before we make any attempts to transliterate and translate whether it's it's uh, formally on Divine Words Wednesdays, you know, where we're formally tr doing this or on a freestyle, which may be called informally. Uh, regardless, we have to follow four steps. So we call these four steps our correct method. So we refer to it as Tep Hesip in terms of translations. So translation Tep Hesip, the correct method in order to translate. And so those four steps, uh, maybe uh, if someone uh, can go over those four steps and kind of uh, summarize what those four steps are, and then we'll we'll walk through them even though we're freestyling. Okay, um, so the four steps are, um, the first step in the, you know, that we use is to um, determine the direction in which um, the signs we are reading or the glyphs are to be read, and um, and we usually do that by um, looking at um, the direction in which um, the the animate glyphs are facing, like um, glyphs such as birds or pe uh, people or animals. Um, those usually help. And then um, the second step will be to um, that's where we identify um, the different glyphs. We, and then um, and then the third step I think that will be we you know that's the parsing stage where we group um, the di different the, the glyphs into words and then then we look you know we look we look them up in the dictionary and then the fourth and the last step is where we come up with a sensible translation all right and that's it okay excellent so those are the four steps and I hope everyone if you've been following um, our uh, YouTube channel, then you should pretty much know that like the back of your hand. And if you're new, then we have um, other videos in our archive where we go over those four steps 
uh, in very in great detail. In fact, even uh, Wednesday passed and our divine words Wednesday, we actually went through the four steps uh, in detail when we discussed the um, the inscription that we were using for divine words Wednesday. And that was just this past Wednesday. All right. So um, so do I that was the four steps. So we're going to just kind of walk through those four steps, but in a freestyle. OK, so the the exception that we're not going to use any books. Now, um, a matter of fact, let me see if I can show this entire picture first, because I have it zoomed in a little bit. And let me see if I can get it to where it's showing. The entire picture and that should be good right there. So here is the entire picture. And so what we're looking at is what's called a false door. So this, so this is what we know just by observing the picture itself. It's a false door. And, um, and there's a lot of these in Kemet. And so one of the things we recommend people in the journey of learning the language and, and uh, actually practicing is that when you sit down and uh, make attempts to transliterate and translate, uh, while you're doing that, choose choose one range of inscriptions or one genre. So, for example, if you're going to do if you're going to do this, uh, try to find various different offering formulas. That way you'll find a variety of offering formulas, but you're going to get used to the words and the phrases that are used within the offering formulas. And so you'll, it's easier for you to memorize those because there's a difference between offering formulas and let's just say a, um, a narrative. Like, for example, the uh, inscription that involves the uh, story of the shipwrecked sailor. If you were attempting to translate that and then you translate an offering formula, you're going to find that, that there's a, a difference in, in obviously the vo vocabulary because of the subject matter and everything. So on this journey to learn, it's always good to to stick to one genre for practicing purposes and then switch over to a different genre and then switch again once you develop some kind of familiarity with that particular genre. OK, if, if that makes sense, because you don't want to scatter yourself around too uh, far and wide too fast. All right. That that just kind of slows down the learning process. So I bring that up because we have a lot of false doors. So you may select to do false doors for, let's say, a month. So you may, you may set aside a month to do nothing but false doors. So you try to collect your pictures of false doors, different false doors, and then um, put in the work, put in the practice for that. Then next month, you may want to do just offering, offering tables and offering formulas. And then you may move from there to doing something else. So that that would be a very more uh, a, a much more effective way of retaining the information. All right. Now that's just a recommendation. Of course, you can uh, do it any way that uh, is best for you. All right. So let me zoom back in and then we can get started on this. All right. So bring it down. So we're at the top. And so, of course, we're going to start with step one, which is, as Sasana Imikat said, is to determine the direction in which these glyphs are to be read. Now, uh, with that, some inscriptions will be written only in one direction. So there's not this piece of cake. You just uh, once you make that determination of what direction, then you're safe. And some inscriptions have may have multiple directions of glyphs. And so we have to make that distinction. So uh, so step one, let's discuss step one. So um, anyone can um, unmute themselves and let us know what direction this particular. And I think my cursor. Yeah, my cursor could be seen. So whatever you point me to, I will point it out and then you let us know what direction the glyphs are should be read. Can you, can you hear me? 
To you. Yep. Loud and clear. Okay. Uh, ETM Hotel, Evan. Uh, the direction, if we're starting from the very top of the farm um, door. Wait, wait, wait. Who, who, who are we speaking with? <laughs> uh, Rennie Sean. All right, good. Got to let people know, you know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Cause we yeah we didn't introduce everyone uh, we just letting everyone uh, as you as you all every everybody every, as everyone comes in can introduce themselves I'm sorry okay. but go ahead yep sorry about that all right so at the very top of the false door um you would read from right to left horizontal okay. right to left let me put my cursor there so you said the very top two okay and hopefully everyone can see that. I'm waving my cursor on the top. Okay. And you want me to give some more directions? If there's more. If. Okay. And um, yeah. So on the left hand side, under the seated deity from the top, you vertical right to left. Okay. And then on the other side, you would go vertical, left to right. Okay. Uh, so they're kind of facing each other. Remember, we read into the glyphs, not to the backs. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's that's. Um, I zoomed in, so you can't. We can't see the whole thing in this shot. But uh, but yes. So we have two different directions on this particular uh let me actually zoom out because i want to make that point very very clear let me zoom back out so we can see the whole thing again all right so we have uh two directions or oh, you gave us two directions and uh there's a little bit of confusion with the directions um even even when people are uh, learning it because we have people who who don't know and they may say that um, the glyphs can be read diagonal in circles and you know all kinds of which ways which which is not true um, but there's four directions but there's com some confusion with with the number four because so the way we we can explain it to make it uh, better to, to uh, understand is that we only deal with columns and rows. And so you either have glyphs in columns or you have them in rows. And whether they're in columns or rows, they could be they could be written to be read right to left or left to right. And it's really just that simple. All right, because the reason why I said that is because the top row is as Sunshine pointed out that, and I'm getting feedback from my mic. Okay, there we are. The top, the top set of glyphs is in a row, but they're facing to the right. The glyphs on the left-hand side is in a column, but they're also facing to the right. Now that's not a different direction. Both of those are read from right to left. One is just in a row and the other one is in a, in a column. So to uncomplicate things, it's it's uh, probably easier just to mem remember that you're either dealing with columns or rows. And we could technically say vertical or horizontal. Vertical means columns and horizontal means rows. So you can, you know, say rows or columns and then just understand either it's left to right or right to left. All right. And, it, and it's just that simple. So I just want to make that clear and point that out because otherwise we would count this as two different directions. And then that throws people off because we have horizontal right to left and then we have vertical right to left. And people may look at that as two different directions, but it's not. It's the same direction. It's just that the glyphs are arranged in, in a horizontal row or a vertical column. OK, so that number four can be confusing. So we just don't want anybody to be confused about that. When we say four directions, it's really two directions, either columns and rows. Two by two is four. All right. So let me um, bring this back up. 
and now we can go into step two so step two as uh sonnet emmy cat said step two is the identification step and normally we would use a sign list or a glyph list to aid but on freestyle friday that's forbidden we don't use it but um so for step two let's go ahead and identify some of these glyphs um, and we're going to skip the monoliterals and by monoliterals we mean those glyphs that represent single consonants because by the time you're at this point of translating you should already have those committed to memory hands down if you haven't then you don't need to be making attempts to translate all right it's like you know trying to run uh in the in the olympics in a track and field meet and you have no training whatsoever people just don't do that so um so those are the things you should already know so we're going to skip the monoliterals but let's just try to identify some glyphs so you know anyone on the panel um can just kind of call off a glyph and i'll i will uh, follow my cursor and and we'll just use that identity identify it Okay, so <laughs> I will identify uh, some of the glyphs. So we have a B that is um, pretty obvious that we could see. Uh, this particular glyph, or let's start with the sedge plant. This is a sedge plant here. And when we identify uh, these glyphs, we are um, want to identify what the glyph is and remember, all of these glyphs are what's called pictographs. They are pictures of the animal life, plant life, and even man-made objects that was known to the to the people in the Nile Valley. All right, and that's that's important to know that because um, it kind of uh, sets the stage, forms the basis for the indigenous of indigenousness of the writing system you know we don't see tigers as a glyph you won't see a glyph for a tiger why because tigers are asian cats felines all right so these these are our animals and 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 plant life and things that are known for the nile valley area all right which which lets you know that the writing system was definitely homegrown so the sedge plant we would have to identify what it is, but more importantly, we would have to know how it is transliterated and how it can possibly function. So we know that this is transliterated as an S and W. And, and it, uh, in terms of if it's used as a phonograph, and so phonograph will be one of the roles it could possibly function as, or it could function as a logograph for a full word and in, and in this case, it would represent the word Nesu. N-S-W. So those are the things we would have to know about this glyph. And we have to do that for all of the glyphs here. All right. So we see a rabbit or a hare. And this is also, this is a biliteral, which means it's a glyph that represents two consonants. W-N as in Nancy. W-N. So that's a glyph there. We have another glyph here. On our screen, it looks like a circle. It looks like a diamond ring. It looks like a ring, but it's not. And so we know this to be a bowl. And we refer to it as the new bowl because it represents the consonants N, W. N as in Nancy, W, new. Uh, let's see, another glyph here that we see here. And let me see if I could draw a square around it. This particular glyph represents a triliteral. Now, mind you, I'm saying mono, bi, and tri. Mono meaning one, bi meaning two, tri meaning three. So this particular glyph represents three consonants. And this is a, a popular word and should be the popular, a popular glyph. But this represents the, the consonants H, T, 
P. And we say it, pronounce it as Hotep. So that is a, a, a mat with an offering on top of bread. All right, so let's see, let's pick another one. Uh, let's scroll down here. We have another glyph here that is should be common. This glyph here, which is a biliteral. It represents an enclosure, a floor plan of an enclosure, and it represents two consonants, P, R. All right. So, and you would do that for step two, you would need to do that for every glyph. Now, when I say that, it may seem like that's a long thing to do, like, but you only need to look up the glyphs that you all that you're already not familiar with. So, you know, you can skip the ones that you are already familiar with, which means that as you practice this, the more glyphs that you memorize, then the more glyphs that you will um, have no need to look up. And so it'll make the process faster. So when you're starting out as a beginner, you're going to have to be patient with yourself and have discipline because it's, it's going to be a tedious job for you in the beginning for all of us. But as I said, once you get used to what the glyphs are, then you won't have to do that. So same thing in the first grade. In the first grade, when you're taught to, you know, enhance your reading skills in the first grade of school, uh, you may be given a paragraph. The teacher will tell you to read it. And you may see a bunch of words because you're just a first grader. You know, you may see a bunch of words that you don't know what the meanings are. And what, so what does the teacher tell you? Well, take it home, homework, look up all these words. So you, you, you're given a vocabulary list. You got to look up all the words. And so that's tedious. But by the time you get to the sixth grade and you read that same paragraph, you have no need to look them up. You'll know what the words mean and, and everything. So this is the same. All right. So anyway, that's so I just wanted to go over uh, step two. So step three uh, would be the parsing step. So step three would be to take every single individual glyph that you now recognize from performance step two. Now you have to group these glyphs into the words that they form. And the reason for that is because unlike English, Sesh Metanetra has no punctuation. We have no commas, no periods no um, spaces in between words. So we have to know where one word ends and another one begins. And so there are things that help us with that, but I will um, pass the mic and, and uh, maybe someone else on the panel can uh, give us a couple of words, point out a couple of words, and then what helps us determine that those are words. Um, on the, on the top row. All right. Um, there are, there's the first word that I see that will be the first one, two, three, four, four glyphs. One, two, three, four. Okay. No, 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 no. The first three. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. The first three glyphs. Yes. One, two, and three. All right. All right. And that will be Ima Imaku. Okay. And and then, um, but that's just a word that uh, that uh, it doesn't have a determinative. Uh, oh, the wait, 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 wait. What what about it? What about if we look? Um, what if we look at the first five glyphs? I know you can't see the first two in front of that, but <clears throat> if you go down, like if you go down one line, you can see the word imaku right in front of the seated person. So. I believe that's the glyph that's damaged in front of the first row. Uh, and you would be correct uh, in saying that uh, where it appears that there's some damage in front of it. Um, yeah, you have to. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, what I was going to say is that um, Son of Emiket said the word determinative. And, you know, we want to make sure that, that we'd lose no one in in uh who'll be watching our video so what is a determinative um determinatives they are um the glyphs that are used um to 
word and uh, in these cases because um uh, such better nature sometimes we usually have words that ha- share the same consonants and and sometimes share even the same glyphs but have different meanings and uh, we know that uh, the meanings are different uh, depending on on the glyph that is used that it usually it appears at the end of the of, of the word so these glyphs will usually tell us what um what you know what the meaning is the semantic meaning of the glyph you know that is that is um in in question so the tell is a chart um help us to de- to to determine uh the meaning uh, the semantic meaning of, of a word okay and you said again you said that this particular word and uh sun satep uh by the way uh mentioned that there's some damage here and it's very uh interesting because this is one of the things that we have to um be aware of and be flexible of because we're dealing with thousands of year old artifacts and so they're not going to be in this pristine purity or condition um and it's actually surprising that it's in the uh, such a good condition that we still have them in but we will not be uh without any damage so um it's good that you that a person can recognize this word and see it elsewhere where there's no damage so what he's referring to i'm going to kind of put a square around it is this word and the word uh son that can start off with is the exact same word and you can kind of see the damage on this sickle here where the sickle was curved down and then the reed leaf was going up right here so you can see that so even to even to recognize that that comes with time and practice all right so you know a very a, a new beginner may not even recognize it or pick that up but that comes with practice so that's a good way of um bringing that out and showing that so but the- one thing i wanted to say too is um <clears throat> even though in the first row we can't see ima but in the second row, you can see the Ima, so that'll come from the relief and the sickle as well. So and you have the Maku with the uh, the um, the rib and the placenta and the quail chick. Okay, yeah. All right. Um. Now, so because that leads into my question that I was going to ask uh, Sonna Emiket is that when you said that the uh well the visible glyphs is the first is the three here but we we can assume and safely assume that there's the other two are are here but they were damaged so let's count them so we have five glyphs so these five glyphs in fact let me just zoom in on this part right here so everyone can see it these are the glyphs that are being uh referred to here you can see them very clearly now uh, on the screen so these particular glyphs so now you said that there's no determinative so the question that someone may have is how do you know that this was a word if it's no determinative um yeah well usually um if this if there isn't uh, most of the time the, you will not find the determinative so you if it will you have to be familiar with the word uh, that is uh, that is in question, not the word that is in question. But also, I also see that um, you know, right after, um, uh, right on the last glyph, we have the phonetic complement, as uh, you know, there as well. So that is um, that kind of helps as well. And then I know that it can you know knowing what the other glyphs that you know that are after that come into, you know what uh, that they cannot be part of that. So those two things, the phonetic complement, being familiar with uh, with um, just words, and, and and knowing you know what you know that it, you know yeah, I guess those two actually will be will be the best way for you to actually uh, tell where the word you know ends when there's no determinative. Okay. All right. So out of this word, which which ones are the phonetic complements, and what and what 
would they be comp which which glyph is the glyph and then which glyph are the complements to it um so you have um the glyphs that spell out the words you have the the reed leaf and the the sickle which would be e ma and then then you have the the what is it called the rib mm -hmm. and uh and um and then the plus the plus i would say the plus center and and uh and the quill cheek will be phonetic complements okay so, and 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 uh, you will know this because phonetic complements are usually the the monoliterals or the uni unit literals which would be the one the single consonant um glyphs so that would be imak imak or imaku and and then you have the placenta for the um for the lowercase x and uh, and then the um, the quill chick I'll, I'll probably say uh, wait, 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 uh, wait. No, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I was going to say, um, because the, um, can you put it, can you put it back uh, on the screen again? I can't see it. Oh, you can't see it on the screen anymore? Oh, yeah. Okay, I see it. Yeah, no, I was going to say that um, I think it will probably be just the placenta because um, the, the what is it called again? The, 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 the spinal cord, the rib spinal cord will be uh uh em it will be emac so the 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 quill cheek will not be part of the phonetic phonetic complement but will be the last um the last consonant in the word okay so um all right so that's good dua now um just to kind of summarize all of that remember we are on step three so at step two you would you would already know what each of these glyphs are you would know what their possible um, functions could be so at step two which will be prior to where we are you would know this is a reed leaf and it is, represents a single consonant transliterated as an i you would know that this sickle is a biliteral translating to uh, transliterated as two consonants the m and capital a you would know that this spinal uh, this rib or backbone excuse me and spine is a uh, can perform as a logograph or a whole word emak, which is I transliterated as I M capital A and then X, and then you have this um, placenta, which you will already know would, would be transliterated as an X, and then a quail chick transliterated as a W. And so, by knowing all of that first, then when you see them grouped together. This is where you would identify that all of these are in conjunction with each other. Emak, because of this main spinal, spinal um, backbone and spinal cord glyph here. Uh, here. So this would be the main glyph that kind of alerts you to your conclusion that this would be a word. And then uh, the set, that's one. And then two, uh, the fact that once you practice this and once you, once you uh, start to see these words and look them up, over time, you'll be able to recognize this as a word just on first sight. And so that's why I want, so it doesn't have a determinative. So that's what I, why I asked the question, because really it boils down to, this is one of those words that you would, you would um, gain familiarity with because not all words have determinatives. And so this is an example of one of those situations. And so we would just simply recognize this particular uh, word from familiarity. But as we were saying before, the breakdown would be what we were saying. How you would in very in the first place initially see that this is a word. OK, so. All right. So let's move to um, well, let's pick out a different another word. And I don't know if we want to go back to the bigger picture or stay on this one. But let's go to the bigger picture and uh, st yeah, identify some other words. Probably the same as well. Anyway. Yeah, so the next one on that one would be um, the next two, the next two glyphs. Okay, here. Yeah. Okay, 
so uh so again just just to kind of reinforce it how do you know that that's a word and and not all those other glyphs and stuff like that um okay so this one i it it will just be um from being familiar with the with the word okay mm -hmm. um and it's um it only has monolittles or the uni uni unilaterals and um and there are no determinatives on this either and we know and yeah we know that it's not the other words as well just by being familiar with what comes next after that so this will just be familiarity okay all right and what's what is this word since we pointed it out um so this word will be uh a head which will be um lowercase x and um r and um that will be head or in the presence of or before all right okay so for those listening um we when we do the freestyle fridays uh we tend to have the need to combine step three and four uh together uh sometimes and so within step three not only are you parsing words or grouping the the individual glyphs into words but um we this will be the step where you actually use the dictionary but we're not so so some of these words we're going to give the meanings to but then our fourth and final step is that where we come away with a sensible translation to smooth everything out. All right. So um, just to let everyone know that. So any other words we can identify? Let's do two more. All right. Let me do two more since I did. So I messed up last time, last Friday. All, All right. right. So the next word, you got the sedge plant and the uh, raised bread loaf. Okay. That's one word. Now we don't we don't have to go in order. I, I, we, okay. can pick, we can pick oh, out okay, any okay. anywhere. I, I'll just follow you on the curse. I just want to pick out two words. Period. But right, but you well, can do that. So that's that's one right there, and I'll pick another one out. Okay, so you said uh, just repeat that one again. The uh, sage plant and the raised bread loaf. That's okay. one word. In the soup. All right. Then we have another word. Well, what what is it? What does it mean? Oh, king. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. All right. Then you have another word. Um, the um, and what you said that was? It's, it's right before the quail chick. It's like a jug. Um. Uh, just point me because uh, it because it's, it's it's a lot of quail. Same, it's in the same row. Oh, or, over here. You know what? You know what? Let's, you know what? I ain't even gonna do that row. Let's go down to the bottom row. I'll pick a word down there. Okay. Just all right. Bottom row, let's see. One, two, three, four. The four water jugs down there, and you have the uh the raised bread loaf and the water ripple. That's one word right there. Um Okay. Oh, here, where my cursor yeah, is? Right there. Yeah, yeah, right where your cursor is. Okay, and so see so just say it again, because I, I had to find you. You I had to had to catch up to you. So you said the water jugs and then what else? Water is jugs, the raised bread loaf, and the water ripple. That is one word right there. Okay. All right. And what would be that word? First give the transliteration and then and then give a meaning. Uh, the transliteration is Kenti, and you have, uh, I think in this one, we would call those phonetic compliments, the raised bread loaf and the uh, water ripple. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and what would it mean? What does it mean? Kenti is uh, foremost of the Westerns. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, only thing I would add to that is that uh just just to say because see and it, now i'm glad you now matter of fact you did this uh last time too and and it's, <laughs> and it's good that you do this it's good that you do it because it shows how this works how how words and phrases grow on you because you said kent or well, kenty means foremost of the westerners but actually kent only means the it only means foremost the the amenti would be the westerner part okay 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 so so see how see how it's it's, it's 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 right it's it's stuck in your head that way and that's a good thing though because you know just to let people know that this is exactly what we mean that once you deal with this a lot of, a lot of, a lot of times you're going to just automatically know 
what these words are on site and know what they mean. So much so that you're just going to start seeing whole phrases in your mind. And so that's what uh, <laughs> that's what Satep just did again. Um, he said, Kenti, I meant to eat. He probably making it a whole lot. We'll see it, Kenti. I meant to you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but no, that's uh, so that's good. So this is really actually the word Kent. Uh, and it means foremost. So the one who is foremost. All right. So. Um, all right. So that's step three. And so we went through all of the steps. So let's let's take one of these lines, though. And uh, whether it is whether it's the row or. um um or the column here either one but let's let's go ahead and do a full either the full row or a full column just so we can uh demonstrate step four which which come away with a nice smooth translation of something so let's just go ahead and take um let's see let's just use i'm scrolling don't want to do something too long, but let's just take the left column. Actually, if you notice, if I, if I zoom back out, the, le the left column, leftmost column, and the rightmost column, they're mirror images of each other. So once you get the left or the right, you know, either one, then you're good to go for either one because there they're are mirror images of each other. And notice how even the ones in here are mirror images of it. You're, you're looking at a mirror image of, of each of these columns. And so just for the sake of demonstrating step four, uh, we can either do the top row in full. Let's do the top row because that, that's, uh, you know, nice and short and sweet. And so let me um, see if I can fit it all in here. No, that's a little too big. So let me bring it back. Okay. I think that's good enough. So let's do this whole top row here. Most of it was already done, but let's do it to, to demonstrate step four, to come away with a nice, sensible translation that everyone will be comfortable with. Uh, does anybody already have have one or um, can go ahead and do that? Nope. OK, so I got I mean. <clears throat> I think I got one, but it's a little choppy though because I'm free. Well, we freestyling, so go. So yeah, what you want me to do? Uh, transliterate or just translate it first? Uh, transliterate it in full first, All right. and then well, actually give us uh the Egyptological uh, Man. S uh pronunciation. All right. All right. Pronunciation. So let's, 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 we got the first word imaku. Okay. We have uh Kerr. Okay. The Subiti. Uh huh. When S. Uh huh. Uh, I believe that's where I'm stuck at, but I'm gonna just say Kearney and the and the I don't know what that last one, not that one, said in the for that one, that one right there. I think it's um. I know it means I know it means no. I know what it means, but I just can't think of the transliteration of it. Okay. That's, um, I know it's in Hannah Shepsu's name too. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you said. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I just I just can't think of it like off the top of my head. I can't think of it. It'll be Shepes. Shepes. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So all right. So Satep, um. Gave gave his so let's go let's go with someone else uh if anybody has anything um anything I different get the end that that's the uh men board and then it's it's the percent on top of it Kim Men and then that's the new bowl with the phonetic compliment Kim and new okay so we got June I kind of Tep has spoken that too man I, I, but see the only reason why I didn't say it was the men board because I looked in the Chanu. In the in the like, I can't really see it that well, but the the ripples on it is kind of like the same as the ripples underneath the uh, rabbit. That's the only reason why I said Kani. Yeah, I, I was thinking the same as the as well. Going off of that, the 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 you know, in the Shinu, the water ripple in there. Okay, so we have uh, Satep has spoken. Uh, Sun June has spoken. Anybody else?
nope all right so let okay so all right um let me get my cursor back where are we at okay so yes all right so the only thing i would add is that we have imaku care nisut biti winnis and then canoe we have a placenta a water ripple the new bowl and then a complement to that new bowl which is a w the new bowl represents nw and then the quail chick represents a w so canoe and this is a person's name so we have the person who is an elder or a uh, very a person of importance he's sitting down on the chair you can see him sitting here but he has a staff in his hand so this is a person's name canoe and what it's it means it's always them names that get us too whenever we stumped it's usually a name right <laughs> We right. had a determinative too, yeah. yeah was er everybody was on point till we got behind the chanu. Right. And so we have Imaku, Kernis with BT, Winis, and then we have Canoe. So we have the the revered one in the presence of or who is before, and then the dual king, Winis, and then his name. So, so if we were to write this out in English, we would put a comma here to kind of make sure that people understand that's his name. So we would say the 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 revered one who was before the king Winnes, and then a comma, and then canoe to let people know who we're talking about. And so that's that's what it would be. And then this word I said uh, Kent, meaning foremost. The word Kent by itself would be foremost. If this, let me see if I can zoom in on, on this again back here. Because uh, I don't want to leave anybody uh, with any misinformation. This uh, water jug and, and raised bread loaf, this here, if if it was a papyrus roll, it would be the word Kent. And it would be, you know, foremost. Um, a, a, and a papyrus roll would serve as a determinative for words that deal with abstractions and things of that nature. Um, but this is actually a pool of water. And so it would be Kentesh. Kentesh, and that's a totally different word. It doesn't mean foremost at all. It it means it's actually a word for a kind of pool, but the pool. Remember, we're dealing with a hot climate in the Nile Valley. A pool brought about pleasure and delight, and joy. So the word Kentesh, even though it's determined by a pool of water, it means joy and pleasure or delight, delightfulness, etc. Okay, so just want to kind of make sure we are on point with that. And uh, that uh, that correction came from the chat uh, and actually brother Christopher Withers uh, put the make sure we had the uh, S, which would be a capital S. If we transliterate this would be X N T capital S. And so, and again, that would be a different word than foremost. Just so everyone is aware of that. And so, okay, so we have we have demonstrated all four steps. We use the first the first row to kind of demonstrate that fourth and last step. Um, and okay, but let's do this again. Let's do step four. Let's just let's just go ahead and do this. Uh, let me put on a bigger picture here. That's clear. So let's do this one here. Um, so take a moment to look at it and then anybody on the panel can just give, let's just jump to straight, jump straight to step four and let's just give, a, um, the Egyptological pronunciation of it and then the translation. So any, you know, whenever you're ready, anybody, uh, open their mic up and, and, uh, let us have it. <clears throat> Am I cool, care, nature, uh, uh. Canoe, uh, the revered before the great god Canoe. Okay. All right. So uh, that's good. So you said, uh, uh, just say it one more time, just to kind of drive it home. <laughs> uh, right. I had took a bite of my uh, dinner. Excuse me. Uh, uh, Maku, care, nature, uh, uh, canoe, uh, the revered before the great god, 
canoe. All right. It cared. Excellent. And that's it. Imaku care nature a canoe. And there we are. All right. So um, just to kind of let everyone know that um, when we get to step four, the actual final translation, there's a difference between transliteration and translation. Uh, there's several differences, but one of the things that needs to be pointed out is that translations are not an exact science. There is some uh, uh, art involved and by art, meaning that two different two or more people may come away with slightly different translations on how they chose their words to translate, um, you know, any kind of inscription. And the reason for that is because when you translate meaning from a source language into a target language, there is um, room for uh, options because there's rarely a chance that you'll have a one for one 100 percent direct correlation coming from one language into another and this goes for all languages around the world and so there's a little bit of area of play uh there and discretion that's involved so the example i always use is the word um hemet nasut uh, so one person may translate it as wife of king. Another person may translate it as king's wife. And a third person may translate that as queen. But if you notice, all of that means the same thing. So so when you translate, it's not going to be an exact 100 uh, percent science between between different people. But on the other hand, transliterations uh are very precise so any two people using the same transliteration system they should have the exact same thing so keep that in mind when you're you know as you're on this journey of learning uh the language that your transliterations should be on point so there's a like one plus one is two then this glyph right here this placenta glyph is always going to be transliterated as a lowercase x just as sure as you can say one plus one is always going to be two okay and so that's where the more definitive uh aspect comes in transliterations but again translations you know you got a little bit of playing room there all right so keep that in mind and and um everyone should be aware of that all right so um so anyway that's that's uh all we have for for this freestyle friday and you know i know we were nice you know kind of short and and sweet with it tonight but um we can kind of open it up a little bit for for any brief discussion so if anybody on the panel if you have something that um that you wanted to uh discuss let me show you all some other pictures of this particular artifact so this is a false door and it's obviously the false door of this particular person so this is a canoe and you see him sitting down here before an offering table. So you so you see now <laughs> what's funny. Let me go back to this picture is that some people will look at this and think it's it's a Manara or or some kind of can't uh, a table with candles on it, you know, waiting to be lit, you know, uh, but it's not. These are actual uh, tall loaves. That are being offered and you see a different variety of things you see you're seeing uh incense you may see uh some kind of meats you see the um ka which will be uh beef or whatever the case is raised bread here um usually you may see what's called a trestled duck which is a duck with the belly showing and a, and a line through it to show that it's uh or oh, trestled goose, I should say, excuse me, um, to show that it's dead and, and you know, it's being offered or it was it was, it was uh, went through a process of cooking or whatever the case is. Uh, so you, you so in other words, you see a lot of offerings here that are before uh, this particular particular person. Um, but let me just show you all some other pictures of it. Uh, here's another picture of the same location. I'll zoom in a bit. And as you can see, this is also um, speaking about the same king. So we say we see a uh, Winnie's. 
Now, if you ever look up this king, uh, a lot of times it'll be it'll be uh, transcribed as U N A S Unes. So if you need to look up that particular king, although we're pronouncing it as Winnie's, but the people spell it U N A S Unes. All right. But if you transliterate it, it would be W N I S. So we kind of try to pronounce it true to the way it's spelled out. So Winnie's. Um, okay, so we have that there. And let's see, did I have another picture? And here's another picture. Oh, that's the same thing. But we see over here on, on this side here, we have more inscriptions that are over there. And here's a close-up, even close-up of the king's name. But now notice this. Now this is what's 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 really, really uh mind blowing is that this is made, I believe this is made of limestone. And so we know that limestone in and of itself is porous and it's and it's softer than granite and, and the other types of stone. And mind you, King Winnie's. Let me ask anybody on the panel about what dynasty is King Winnie's involved with? Just take a just take a guess. Anyone take a guess? I would say the fifth dynasty. Okay, say it one more time. Say it up. Pick up. The fifth dynasty. Okay, and 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 okay, he's in a very very old kingdom. So so you know because we're not trying to look up anything. We don't have any books or whatever. But let's just say the fifth dynasty. Because I believe you're you're right. Fourth or fifth uh, dynasty. So mind you, this is the fifth, fourth or fifth dynasty. That's a long time ago. So you know how old this has to be. But look at the detail. You can actually still see the the lines within the reed leaf. In the in the um the chisel right here, you can still see the detailed line in the top part of the chisel. You can still see the lines in the ears of the hair rabbit. You understand? So so this is mind blowing that that these details still exist after thousands of years. And and look, this is not inside. This is outside. If I if I go back to the other picture, this is outside. So to me, you know, that's it's just amazing. This is outside. That that's that's amazing in and of itself. And look at the uh, falcon here. You can still see the details. All right. So uh, I mean, detail. Look at the basket. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on that. Uh, it gets kind of blurry when I zoom in. But even the vulture and the and the cobra, what they're sitting on, standing on. Um, you can see the details of the basket. Look at the wings of the bee. I mean, this is amazing. And, and it's small details like this, I think we overlook. We don't realize like, you know, we 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 tend to talk about dates like like it's it's nothing. And we have to talk about we, remember the average person's lifespan. What is um, I mean, nowadays it's it's pretty good. It's about what what's the average lifespan of a human being now uh, that they average out what, 85 or something. But. You know, regardless, the point is that we're we we talk about thousands of years as if as if it's nothing. You know, that's a long time. You know, think about it. How many how many of us can say that you still have something that you owned 20 years ago and, and it's in very good condition? There's not too many items that you could find in your house that you ha you've had for 20 years and it's still in really good condition if you still had it at all. You see, so these, you know, these little things we, we take for granted. So it was a it was a man. It was very important for these things to last a very long time, which is one of the reasons why they carved it in stone in, in the first place for for longevity. And it's certainly um 
fulfill that purpose. All right. So, you know, let's not take this stuff, this stuff for granted. So these pictures that you find, just just keep that in mind. These are this is amazing stuff here. All right. So, you know, um, anyway, that's all I wanted to kind of add. Just kind of bring bring that out and let, you know, remind people that that this is some this is amazing. Amazing, amazing. All right. And the scribes to that 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 did this stuff. And look, this is also amazing. Why is it or how is it that no matter, you know, now we know the Nile, the Nile is a very long river. I believe roughly is 4,100 miles or, or the entire Nile Valley. Um, so let's just round it to 4,000 miles. And if you were to travel up and down the entire stretch of Kemet at any given era of time, the glyphs that you encounter that are done by the scribes in all these different locations, they would be almost identical. Which is another amazing uh, fact or accomplishment. How is it that these scribes in different locations were able to mimic each other's carvings, you know, to the point where they look so much alike? You know, so that's amazing. And notice I said era of time because you do have shifts. Like, for example, in the old kingdom, there was a certain style that was done everywhere. And then when you get towards the middle kingdom, it, it the style, you can see the shift, but it, it remained consistent within that era of time. And then in the new kingdom, uh, in the late period, you can start see, like, for example, uh, the Temple of Edfu and the uh, Temple of Het Heru at Dendera, those two temples, um, the style is, are identical. The styles are identical. But all of this, all of this I'm saying is, it's just amazing. So, so we have to remember that we can't, you know, we can't, um, you know, just kind of, uh, what do you call it? Whistle that away. That that's something that we need to uh, be mindful of. All right, amazing amazing stuff so anybody else have anything nope well let's look at the chat real quick and we have uh first of all say etm hotep to those again who may tuned in um after we started and i'm scrolling up and i'm scroll back down so um, I think everyone's participating. So it's good. We invite people to participate and and um, and to be along. So we have uh, so I want to say Hotep to uh, Julanda Hotep uh, Zane or Zani. If I'm mispronouncing that, forgive me because I, I see everyone's participating. Uh, son at Lisa, son at Monica, uh, Monica or Monica. Uh, Brother Christopher Withers, uh, yeah, he's the one that uh, corrected the uh, Kintesh or Kintesh. Uh, oh, okay, so we have a question. Uh, Zane says, what are the glyphs for Nisud Biti? All right, let me just show those in case you didn't already get that answer. Let me zoom in. And I believe it was on our original picture right here. So if you want to know which glyphs are for Nisud it, it there are these four glyphs. The sedge plant, the raised bread loaf beneath it, the bee, and the bread loaf beneath it. Those four spell out the words Nisud Biti. And that means uh, we just simply refer to it as dual king. And, you know, may, you may see it translated as the king of upper and lower Kemet. So if I say dual king or king of upper and lower Kemet, uh, you know, that's the same means the same thing. All right. So um, and then, you know, there's more to that phrase, uh, you know, like details of how it came about and 
and some more more inf information that that's behind it you know for example uh nisut uh could possibly refer to the institution of kingship itself and then the bt uh could represent the actual institution of eldership the fact that the person who's holding the position of kingship represents a long line of others that held that position then you have the institution itself and the responsibilities of that institution of kingship so we have ni sut and then bt so you know there's other you know there's other things about that but when it comes down to it uh we can simply say dual king or king of upper and lower kemet and it is the throne name or the throne to introduce the throne name so when east would be the throne name of this particular king that you see inside of a chenu to the right of it i'm um, excuse me to the left of it and um the name is contained within the chenu and you see it's here you see it uh down here as well all right so anything uh, let me scroll some more let's quickly see it says um Uh, so that Lisa says, what's before that? Looks like three thrones. Uh, and I'm assuming you're talking about right here. And that's correct. It's, there's three thrones there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, isn't all of it in limestone? Oh, me, refer, referring to the picture that I showed before, uh, I believe so. We say all of it, at least all of what I'm showing is is limestone. All right, let's skip down some more. Uh, okay, everyone's saying, um, got it, got it, got it. Okay. All right, so um, I guess that's it. Uh, anyone else has anything? <laughs> and I can honestly oh go ahead I'm sorry oh let me just say uh, shout out to the chat <laughs> I mean it feels good we've been putting in you know this work for a couple years and I remember you know when we uh, didn't have that much viewership and especially that much uh, participation so it feels good to see um, people taking an interest into our shows and also the language so yeah shout out to the chat and uh, also I know um I think I'm not sure if it's this one we're exactly working with, but the uh, brother, Uncle uh, Unc Benu, had went out to Kemet and uh, took some pictures. It, it, um, so shout out to the brother too. Oh, and, you know uh, what? I'm glad you said that, and I misspoke earlier. I believe that this picture came from uh, the brother um, Unc Benu. And I believe Christopher Withers is the one who first chimed in on it in the comments. So I want to correct myself. I believe this is an actual picture that Unc Benu had taken himself personally when he went on his uh, last trip to Kemet. And let me just make sure because, I, like I said, I, I don't want to uh, misspeak. And and that's correct. So th this is the brother Unc, Unc, Uncle Menu Sa Benu. Um, who's always, you know, he's he's a, a brother who's been on our show before and everything. He posted this picture. So this is one of his personal pictures that he's taken from his trip in Kemet. And he's actually having a trip. He does a trip, uh, I believe, every year so far. Um, I know he has one scheduled for this year coming up, I believe, in September. But if you want more information, s seek out the brother, uh, Uncle uh, Menu Sabenu. He's on Facebook. And um, maybe someone could type his name in the chat just to have it on on um, record so people can look him up and uh, seek out uh, what he has going on in terms of the trip for this year over to Kemet. But yes, he's the one that posted the picture and Christopher Withers is the one who chimed in on it. And so I want to uh, correct myself on that uh, and do a June because you you had uh, just reminded me um, of that. All right. So, yeah, we want to make sure we have things right around here, you know. All right. 
And um, okay, the brother Chris says, uh, "Can I get this picture?" Yeah, just the one that we have. The the uh, now I know it's a delay, but if you can let me know which picture you talking about, the one I'm showing right now currently, then it's no problem. Oh right, okay, I'll I'll send it to you. Yeah, this now mind you, this picture that I'm showing is not the one that Unc Uncle uh, Menu Sabenu posted i i'm using a picture that i already had of it uh only for clarity because when people post pictures on facebook they kind of scale down and so in order for me to show it clear i use the pictures that i already have and and like i said just just my recommendation to people you know what i do what i've done over the years is that i i just collect a lot of pictures of of anything in kemet like if i see it it's in kemet i save it and I look for the biggest picture, the highest resolution of those pictures. Um, and if I find one of the same picture at a higher resolution, I'll replace mine with it. And so I'm always working towards higher resolutions, better pictures and and everything. So I, I had already had this this picture of, of this um, this artifact. Um, but yeah, the uh, the brother Uncle Uncle my. Uh, Uncle Menu Sabenu is the one who originally posted it and inspired us to go ahead and work on it for tonight. Okay, so shout out to the brother. All right. And matter of fact, let me type his name in so you all you all will know. Uh, it's Uncle Menu Sabenu. So look for him on Facebook. Uh, friend him. Tell him uh, send. Uh, Brother Wajau uh, sent you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anybody else? Sunshine, you have anything? Oh, I think you said you were driving. So we want to make sure you stay safe and drive. <laughs> we don't want any, uh, you know, texting and driving or whatever the case is. Um, all right, so uh, Sunday Emicat, if you have anything to add, and also you can close this out. Sunday Emicat? Nope. All right. Can you all still hear me? I have to check every now and then. <laughs> yeah, you still there. Okay. All right, so I'll close it out. And uh, again, I want to say dua, dua u for everyone participating. And I echo the same words that June said. It's really good to see that people are catching on because one of our goals is to raise an army of people that are competent and proficient in the language because it is through the language that we'll understand the culture and the civilization there's no getting around that if you try to understand kemet outside of the language you're going to be handicapped and if and if and if you're satisfied with that then hey more power to you but the best thing to do would be to learn a language because it's through the language that we can allow the ancestors to speak and it's only through the language that we can hear them all right. Now we can do the eyeball test or what we call lookership and just look at everything and just speculate and guess and have a body of 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 information that's full of guesswork. But why do that when we can learn the language and read exactly what the ancient remage or the ancient Egyptians say for themselves? Let's go straight to the horse's mouth, as they say. And that's what we encourage people to do. And so our intention is to raise an army of people, of scribes. And so that's why we have as our uh, logo, just to put it back, we have our um, scribal institution. And so we are we are laying the foundations for an institution of scribes as it was once done in the past. And so an army. Remember, Kemet had an army of scribes and i'm using army figuratively but it had it had a, a a a whole troop army whatever you want to call it of scribes 
and scri and the scribes was was the bloodline of of the structure and order of the the um the country because it it is through the scribal institutions that everything was kept in order and records were kept and things you know if and if you if you're familiar with the profession you have the royal scribe the scribe of the army the scribe of the granary the scribe of the treasury the scribe it was a scribe for everything you know so you know we want to we want to get that back when it when it comes to kemet all right so um so it feels good to have more and more people uh become involved and learn and, and to see people to catch on and actually do well. So that's really good. So that's all I have to say. And uh, just make sure that you also check out. Let me uh, share this as well. If you're interested in learning uh, the language, uh, there is a full beginner's course that's on our uh, website, sabauniversity.com. That's S-E-B-A university, one word, dot com. Saber University, you can sign up anytime. The course is designed uh, to complement the uh, book that you see on the left hand side, which is the textbook that's used for the course, A Beginner's Introduction to Meadow Nature. All right. And so the course walks you through the book uh, chapter by chapter. And you're also able to once a week be able to uh, interact live with other students who are learning as well as the teacher. All right, you be able to get your questions answered and and uh, everything explained to be, make it uh, crystal clear. Um, also in the middle, which is our, our latest book written by uh, Sonnet Emiket, this is Simplified Seshmeta Nature Penmanship, and this is only book one. It teaches you how to draw all of the monoliterals step by step. So it's recommended to get that because along with reading, we have to write. And writing what you read helps retain the information and on the third the book on the right hand side the third book is the rebuttal to the uh, question of whether or not the hieroglyphic writing system been deciphered and this was recently spawned by professor walter williams and we wrote a rebuttal book to the claims that he made in his book and that book has a lot of jewels and information in it about the writing system itself things that you have to know in order to know whether the writing system been deciphered or not and so we equip you with the information to to make that determination all right all three of these books can be uh, found on amazon.com and so uh you know make sure you have a copy and um and any questions that you have we have our facebook group all the questions are welcome um if you you know sharing information all of that is welcome all right so that and that's and that's also how you support our efforts is by uh purchasing the books uh joining the websites and participating because we have projects that we have lined up that we want to tackle and as a group collective seshu mighty meta nature we're trying to um progress in those projects and our group by the way is open it's co-ed it's men and women and it's open to anyone to, uh, we have two main requirements two major immutable requirements one is that you have to um be, make an effort to cultivate good character so so we we emphasize good character now we know everyone is not at the same level when it comes to stuff like that or whatever case is uh, and we're all a work in progress. So we're not asking people to, um, you know, be perfect individuals before you join our our group or what, what have you, because we're not. So we're all, you know, cultivating it. But you have to have an interest of that cultivation. And so that's very important to us as it was to the ancient remage. That's one. Two um, is that you have to have suitable proficiency at a beginner's level of the language in order to join the seshu as a group so those are the two major requirements and it's very easy now it doesn't mean you have to take a course our course or a course with me you could have you could you could learn on your own or have learned in the past with another teacher or on your own but in order for us to know that you're proficient 
we will give you a proficiency exam if you're interested in joining the group. And that same proficiency exam is open for anybody to take if you want to become certified with us, even if you're not interested in joining the group. So it, it's it's a way that that allows you to know that, you know, you're you're in sync with what we have going on as well. And so we, we will issue you a, a proficiency exam. And some people have shown interest in that. And uh, we will have that up on the website as a, as a separate thing that you can um, do and be involved with. Now, we certify our students. And so anyone who has a certificate from our courses in our institution, uh, we vouch for. And so we don't give them out very easily. So so you, you know, believe that that you will be tested <laughs> and and, you know, you have to definitely uh, show forth your proficiency before you are awarded any types of certificates. All right. So I think that's all I have. I have. And I want to say again, do I do a for um, joining us? And with that, I will say Shemim Hotep.